but we're seeing a much more commercialization, not based around, they all want numbers, but that's going to change because of the regulatory environment. But they're all wanting to find that niche area. You know, I think one of the best examples is UniSA. Mm. They've been instrumental in trying to find new nuggets, let's call it. You know, their partnership, which they began Accenture. with Accenture. Yeah, Amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm your host, Rob Milliken, coming today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. I'm really stoked about today's guest because 20 years ago, when I first got into international education in the early 2000s, I was sitting in a little meeting room at Macquarie University and one of the true legends of the industry, Tony Adams, came in and he said to us, we've got a special guest coming in to present a piece of research that I've commissioned. And in this industry, there are three consultants that you need to know about. There's Alan Olson, there's Melissa Banks, and then there's today's guest, Rob Lawrence. And for the last 20 years, I've been incredibly grateful, not only to call Rob a mentor, but a friend. Rob, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Rob, that's the greatest pleasure. And of all people, it really is lovely to have such a nice introduction from you. And mate, Tell me how you ended up in that room presenting that report at Macquarie University. How do you end up in international ed? Absolute luck. I just arrived in Australia back in the late 80s and I was working for a UK company. We did a lot of market planning and something came across my desk, which was, I was always interested in education, but it was to help Deakin with the setup for distance education. So we're going back to the early days of what was then something really different. And that that was an interesting little job involving media and planning and stuff. And I was on the planning side. And next thing is there's another organization called Open Universities and they wanted to launch. And so I worked on the launch of that. And then suddenly there's this tiny little university called Monash that said, can you help us with some stuff? I had decided to stay in Australia. I started to enjoy it. I thought, hold on, I'll focus on education because I'm really interested in this space. And Monash said, can you help us with some strategies to build international and the words quickly spread and Monash became Flinders and suddenly Flinders became Murdoch and Murdoch became JC and all these universities. And I think when you were at Macquarie and that was one of the first that really got its act together in uh, international being separate, you had a VC at the time who said, I want to own international and built this team, you know, the likes, you look at the legends of the industry, you know, there's Tony and yourself, but people like John Maloney who've, Tremendous, extraordinary careers. Off, off the planet, in other words. That's what I'm trying to say. Davina Potts, Joe Bing, Deb Langton. I mean, huge, huge names at Macquarie back in the day. And I've seen that in my life just two or three times where one place becomes a learning platform for a lot of people who then go out and spread the word. And um, it really was, Macquarie was it. Do you remember it used to be called the, we were asked to brand it one day and we decided we're going to call you Australia's Innovative University because Monash had taken international. And you had a VC who just plastered it everywhere on every billboard around Sydney. I started working in the late 90s on jobs. You know, for example, I did the feasibility for RMIT in Vietnam. Now, everyone says, oh, that would have been easy. It wasn't. It was paper. There was no online research. And then in 2000, the brand of the new world class for education New Zealand. And so then there was that stage where people wanted to professionalize and they wanted a better understanding of markets. So I was in the field so much. And one stage I worked out that I was interviewing personally in focus groups, forums, seminars, 10 to 12,000 international students a year. Yeah, well. And I would be on a plane somewhere doing field work for a campus or for a program or for a merger or for a closure. I'd be, you know, every six weeks in the different markets. My favorite was getting stuck in India in floods for a group of eight university, which remained nameless. We did the feasibility for the IBTs, which then became eventually Navitat, feasibility for Monash College as a concept in the early days. But we got new management. We, we're seeing trends now. I've worked a lot in the last 12 months on business to business stuff and business to industry, where industry becomes part of the partnership through the delivery of offshore programs. Compare entrepreneurialism, the entrepreneurialism of the sector back in the early 2000s with what you're seeing now. How has that changed? Well, the entrepreneurism back then was the freedom that many international offices were allowed to act. And that also got down to some very inspirational 
I can think of at least a dozen deans and, you know, faculty deans, let's call them at the title, who were really progressive and they they drove it. You know, there are places like Curtin Business School, which are down the product of a dean. Now it's become much more of a commercial operation. So if you get a VC or a DVC involved now, often they don't come from the international agenda. So they don't come from that portfolio of understanding necessarily the based on years and years of understanding. It's based on having to do quick, you know, it's almost like a new minister, a government minister having to come quickly up to speed. Yes, that, that's a challenge in its own right. But we're seeing a much more commercialization, not based around, they all want numbers, but that's going to change because of the regulatory environment. But they're all wanting to find that niche area. You know, I think one of the best examples is UniSA. Mm. They've been instrumental in trying to find new nuggets, let's call it. You know, their partnership, which they began with Accenture. Amazing. UniSA online was wonderful. And, you know, they discovered a few years ago that maybe offshore online has to have a different shape. They've now changed that shape and they've brought that into that whole pedagogy. And I still don't believe, unless you're an American university, people will have the same approach to offshore online as they do as onshore online. Hmm. Only because the pool, and I keep stressing this to people, if that's the pool now, that's the pool in in one year, that's the pool more than I can stretch in 10 years. And as the pool stretches the price levels change. Mm. So I look at it as a pyramid and, you know, the ones who are onshore at a place of their choice, maybe the top 1% of the, all of the international students potential, maybe at a default option, you're now down to the top 3%. Below that, if you can't tick off, I can pay, I can make the English standard, I can make the academic standard for entry. And yes, my personality means I can fit in that country. They cannot tick those four boxes. They're a T and E applicant. Yeah. And then we get T and E. And now we've got all these models. You know, we had the traditional T and E programs in the likes of Taylors, and that's all changed. And we're seeing new sophisticated T and E, and people are trying to be different. When you say, how's all that changed? It's changed from being we had an open market where the world was our oyster, where India and China weren't even on the radar at the time, to now. Not only do we take a strategy in India, which is obviously a high growth market, but how do we have a strategy for each of the states? Because the behaviors, the drivers, the cultural backgrounds of each state are so different. It's context, isn't it? Don't you think it's like as a market saturates and you have to find niches and things like that, context just becomes increasingly important. And for example, you know, and this might date this, this episode a little bit, but Deakin and Wollongong both making, you know, significant moves on uh, moving campuses into India. Like that's all important context and and footprint that creates a stronger affinity in that particular place, in that very small segment, right? Let's say 36 university campuses opened in that region. That might cater for 1% of demand in India and maybe 10% of demand who could tick all the boxes. You'd still go back to an international student in Australia, say. They still want the campus experience in Australia. Now, they're getting less of that as more domestic students don't go to campus. What you're getting is different now from 2019. So we've got to make sure we address those any loopholes. We've got to make sure we still offer the same extra and co-curricular options, the same access to places, the same access to courses and content and programs, which they can learn in the classroom. And we've got to make sure what we don't do is take what works in Australia into these markets because, you know, we might be very confident and comfortable working online here. The strength of our domestic position determines our strength of our international position. And so we can't sacrifice domestic for international. Domestic is still the foundation which drives everything. So we need Good students, good research, good facilities, good opportunities, good everything. Not just good, but world best. So, and that affects rankings. And without the rankings, we don't get the recognition. And that's what we saw in, I mean, Alan Olson just put out a little analysis in the Koala News 
where yep. he was um, looking at the breakdown based on rankings and 90% of Australian universities are in the top 1,000 yep. versus 50% in the UK and 30% in the USA approximately. So the overall system here rem- continues to be world-class. You can go to any university and basically get a world-class yeah. education. But then so, so one of the things that, that I've always marveled about your work, and you know, every time we go to the annual conference, go to AIEC, and you're up there presenting just the most extraordinary data that comes right from the coalface, what students are saying. I mean, I don't think anybody over the last 20 years has spoken to as many students as you have. What are you hearing these days? What's changing and what's new and different about those audiences that you've been talking to? This is proof that this conversation was not on notice. (laughs) Um, uh, I'll tell you what they're becoming. They're becoming more informed. Mm. And they're more informed about their entitlements in terms of what we deliver. They're more informed about specializations within programs, not just, it used to be a broad brush title like degree in business. They now want to know about specializations within business. They talk therefore about cyber or AI or those things, smart tech. Aware of the options available to them much more because of social media. And we've got to learn to understand them. I'm, I am back speaking to more students than, than the last eight years, I'd say. It became a little bit more online. People were kind of saying, can we do an online survey? We don't want to go in the field. I'm starting to get back in the field a lot. You know, I used to go out and have, get interviews with 500 students. It might be a really discreet 30 mm-hmm. who I need to speak to. And that gets down to incredibly precise recruitment. You know, getting some, knowing who they are, not advertising for a student. It used to be we could advertise and we'd get loads. It's not that anymore. It's it's knocking on their door, not them knocking on ours. So it's taking very sophisticated recruitment to get the right people. What do you think is going to be important for institutions and maybe the education system as a whole going forward outside of the academic sphere? So into that, you might lump working to graded learning, mobility experiences, the, the types of the types of programs available. You know, before we started recording here, we were talking about how the traditional undergraduate three-year degree for a, an 18-year-old seems like an enormous commitment that may be over the top. Where do you see that whole evolution of demand taking higher education in Australia? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I This is where the domestic international space comes into play. Domestically, I think our students are much more... There are those who want the traditional three-year experience. They want the two semesters, long breaks, mobility, you know, gap years, all that stuff. They'll still be around, but there's also those group who are more enterprising, who are more creative, who want to do their own projects. We might not even bother with university because now there are so many... So many of them have got their own startups. I mean... You know, you and I did some work years ago on the number of students going into things like the new Colombo plan and mobility programs. And I think you had something like just under 20% of your students had their own startup. And I would argue now that of those who really want to go somewhere, maybe that's 30%. So, you know, and that's, I'm not talking about a startup, which is a, a personal trainer. I'm talking about a proper, it might be something to do with data analytics or web design, all that stuff. So we've got people who've got their own interests, they've got their own projects, they might have invented something. So then they're in a bit of a more of a hurry. Yes, domestic, there will still be a d- demand for uni, but let's not put them all in that same category. Now, internationally, they have to have degrees. We've got a challenge here because universities have to cater for domestic as their immediate priority and international. What the two want is actually different. It's a huge challenge. That is a mega challenge. And you know, I see universities trying different strategies to say we might go into block mode or we might go into trimesters or we might go into X, Y, Z. But the reality is you've got to have more flexibility and you, agility in pedagogy and agility in approach. And we've got to start looking at different star dates. We've got to look at different ways of delivering. But we've also got to work within the restrictions of how much can be online to an international. It's so interesting. Like I, um, over the Christmas holidays, I was... Interest, got interested in no code development. I've always been interested in coding, but I, oh, I haven't got the time to learn how to code. And someone was telling me about these no code software development platforms. So I thought, oh, great, I'll look into that. 
and I found one called Bubble, very well known. And I thought, oh, I'd like to learn how to use Bubble. And so I went online and for 100 US dollars, I've purchased a 60 hour online course that I'm working my way through in, in my own time, 100 bucks. And then, you know, there was a special on. So for an extra 100 bucks, I took the advanced course as well. So I've mm. literally got this thing that's just sitting on the side of my desk where, you know, when I've got half an hour, I'm going across and, and tinkering with it. And it occurred to me as I was making that purchase that this is actually what universities are competing with now. Because in the past, if you wanted to requalify in software, you had to go and do a short course at TAFE or yeah. uni. But now everything's in play. And when uni's not cheap, it's not fast, it's not necessarily right up to the minute in terms of its content, how the hell does it compete? Well, this is, you know, I'm a dad. I've got, you know, my kids went through the traditional route of university, but one of them really was probably much better suited doing VET and a whole series of really good specialist short courses with a view to maybe one day doing a professional certificate. She's much more that line, you know, kind of the other is much more traditional line. And I actually think whose big mistake might be not doing masters because dad, I don't need a masters for what I do. I, I can progress up the career line. So, and do you remember those days when, you know, kind of 20 years ago, 70% of masters students at um, one university in Melbourne were part sponsored by their employers. Mm -hmm. Employers ain't doing that anymore. Why would I sponsor someone to, for them to clear off next week? Just wouldn't do it. The same as employers now taking people on short-term contracts and projects. They're not taking them on the big graduate employment runs. You know, I would say, I, I'm only guessing here, Rob, but I would say only 5% of graduates, domestic graduates, get onto a proper graduate entry scheme where it's formally, formal training. Probably even less than that compared with when I was a kid coming out of uni, maybe 40% went on to one. We did the milk run. So those days are gone. The other thing is that's going to change is the pool. I think we should stop thinking 18 to 23. Those days are gone. I guarantee within 10 years' time, 25 plus, no, say 50% of international students will be aged at least 25 years old because they might be coming back for, a, they might already have a master's degree. They might be coming back for a core specialization. So our institutions need to really look, I'd, I'd place, I'd bet my house on that one. It's going to be learning throughout life. So I might be 51 years old and I might be wanting to have a specialist skill set, which I'm seeing everyone else has got. And if I don't get it, I'm gone. And why should I be learning at 51 or why should I be learning at 58? Because at 58, I might need to keep working until I'm 70. So unless I keep up, I'm going to fall behind and I might not want to go and have a career in Bunnings. So, you know, it's just, it's just, I don't want to have, I, I might want to stay at the edge of my career. So we can't judge everyone the same way. It's that shift from like just in case learning to just in time learning where. Yeah, that's you know, I think, spot on. Yeah, I think we used to, we, you know, everyone used to go to, you know, get a, go into uni and the now 45% of people, 50% of people have a degree. Great. That's the kind of just, it, just in case learning model where we're expected to continue education because it was expected. But just in time is going to become more and more important. And then institutions now have to compete for that different demand model rather than the traditional model, if that makes sense. Yeah, but people often have said to me, you know, kind of how do you get into research? And I've said, you know, kind of what degree do you do? And I said, well, my degree was nothing to do with research. It was geography. But the most important learning I had was when I left school, I did an apprenticeship in advertising. So I did two years of learning to read people. And we used to get told, sent homework on the apprenticeship. We used to go around people's rubbish bins to see what they ate. And we had to take number plates of their cars on their driveway to see how old their cars were and how much they were worth. That was the best training ever. And if I was training someone now, I might still tell them to go and look at people's rubbish bins or look at what type of computer they're using or the type of phone they're using or who they fly with, because that will give you a hell of an indication about who you're dealing with. It's like when I work on campuses, unless a city can tick four boxes 
It's not even worth doing the research. How many new five or six star hotels are there? Do they have a direct international? How many European cars are being sold each year and growth rate? And how many international schools are there? If there's naught to any of those, don't bother. It's not a place to have a, a, a campus. There are a few other secondary tiers I apply. I'll be giving away all the secrets, but I was going to say, Rob, you've just given away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the reality is, there's about ten which secondary ones which you have to tick as well, and they're a little bit more complicated. But that's why I've always said on day one when I go to a new city, I never work; I just walk the streets, and literally I pad those streets for eight, ten hours, looking at who's there, what's there. You learn so much by having a day walking the streets. Best day you'll ever do doing research. Yeah, incredible. It gives you that context, doesn't it? Like valuable context, which is so much e- so easy to overlook when people are just looking at numbers, looking at the quant, and just trying to trying to figure things out that way. It 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 it's the art and the science, isn't it? <laughs> the art and the science. It is, and it's using the best skills we've got. But the reality was, the the real skills we've got in research are our senses, nothing else. Talking to people, even the smell tells you something. You know, it can tell you a lot about a city. You, can tell, you know, is it polluted? It kind of, what kind of pollution is it? It's, you, you really realise who you're dealing with and what's driving them. I did a campus feasibility in a city which will go without mention in China. And I said I could see it economically, but I couldn't see it soci- socially. It wasn't going to be the right place for a campus other than local people. So... It can put you off and put you on. And I've done drivers as well where I've actually recommended, I once recommended someone not to open in Singapore. And everyone said, but it ticks all the boxes. And it didn't for one reason. And they said, oh, that makes sense. And it was all to do with the status consciousness. So we have to look at all the measures when we do research into who's where and what they're doing. What will be the future? It's got to be market-led. We've got to be ahead of them and we've got to understand them. We need to understand the behaviours. A little bit of a change of change of tact. Where's your favourite place? If I could give you a magic plane ticket out of Melbourne today, fly anywhere in the world, direct, no cost, where would you go? Pleasure. I've always loved parts of Europe, which is obvious, you know, the Delphi Coast and those types of areas. I actually love London as well. I'm a Londoner and I've come to appreciate what my home city has to offer over the years because I miss it so much and I see some appeal. But if I was looking at Asia, there's one place that always sets me alight, Hong Kong. I love landing in Hong Kong. I love three or four days there. Yeah, I've become alive. Don't know why. Now, I've got my favourite place in this part of the world, which is New Caledonia, which I think is an, I'm, okay, this is the greatest advert for New Caledonia they'll ever have because you just escape the world and you're only three hours away. I love Australia, but you know, it's home. I can't really think of a place. There's so many. <laughs> That's a There's, there are so many, way, isn't it? <laughs> there are so many memories. I'd love. To, let me give you an example with answering that. When I go to India, a place I always go to, I love the markets. I love the colour. I love the, the, type, the atmosphere of markets in Vietnam, especially the wet markets and those places. They're different. You don't see anything like it. I suppose I've, I've been very privileged. I've seen a lot of the world, but I still don't think you can beat Europe. I don't think I've done enough of it. Where will be my next favourite place is more interesting. That's a good question, isn't it? It's a great question. I've actually got, interestingly enough, Rob, I was just thinking about it. In my study, I've actually got about 60 or 70 maps on a shelf, which I've used to walk around cities when I've first gone there and ticked off where I've been, and I actually have drawn where I've gone. And I suppose, I haven't looked at them for ages, I might be doing that tonight, having a, a reminder of where I've been, the, you know, the last ones I put up there. Yeah, it's a great yeah. question. Can't answer it. <laughs> and la- last question then, just, just conscious of time. So a bold prediction, either on the demand side or on the supply side. So where do you see something bold happening? Supply side has got to be new types of programs that cater for future behaviours. You know, I've talked about, I talk domestically about professional certificates. Maybe they'll replace postgrad dips or maybe they'll accrue to those. 
I think we're going to have to stop the thinking always long-term degrees. I think people what now as young people often want to consolidate internationally. We'll always have demand for the next 10 years at least for traditional degrees, but we have to embellish those now. I would love to see every international student having an opportunity to do what I call a finishing degree. So almost they do a two month, three month finishing school on their degree to gain the skill sets. We've got to also make sure that international students are embedded into careers in years one and two. This ridiculous situation where they only start working with careers when they graduate is crazy. How can they ever get post-study work rights? So in terms of what we supply, we've got to supply earlier access, more employability options. We've got to make it affordable for ourselves. So we've got to build that into a different type of program. Demand side will be become more sophisticated and much, much more around immersive technologies, AR, VR, all the AI stuff, cyber. People are going to have to want to associate it with definite areas, forensic, accounting. There's probably 50 degrees I could list you now, which will be much more in demand than they are now. I don't think there's any future for the traditional mechanical engineering or electronic engineering, more likely to be degrees in engineering for driverless vehicles or for new energies and stuff like that. So you'll see, I think the application of a degree will become more important than the title of a degree. I'm going to add one more bit to what you said, and this is really controversial, but I, I've always stuck my neck out and I don't mind doing so. I think we're at risk of just looking at the numbers, making sure we make the dollars and not looking at how we're getting the dollars. That to me is is a flag for failure because one, international students are becoming more conscious that they are dollar value. Number two, that risks just going to certain markets which give us a secure pipeline. Number three, it signals lack of creativity unless those dollars are driven by really creative applications and they take years and years to grow. We've got to make budgets, yes, but make those budgets realistic and make them a really realistic way around different initiatives, not just having treating them. I would ban the word international, by the way, from my, if I could, I would say all students should be treated the same as students. They do it in the UK very well and they should be all students. And we should be looking at how we give all students options which creates their outcomes. But what we can do is give skills to enable people to get placements or find other avenues, new opportunities they can self-create, new ideas they can work on, Get it, giving them ways to look at opportunities when they go home in holidays and stuff. It's not just about us arranging a placement for one week, one month, one year in an organisation. It's got to be more than that. We've got to be that nice mixed portfolio where we cater for those who can't afford very much, but we cater for those who want the highest quality education in the world. But whatever end they are, they've got to feel they're getting the best possible value they can possibly seek and know without compromise. Awesome. Rob, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. In the greatest pleasure, Rob. Okay, thank you for having me. Thanks, mate. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.